Welcome to the Reuniting Science and Spirituality Summit, where you'll discover how science and spirituality work together to expand our capacity for healing and transformation. Share this powerful event with your friends and family, and join our conversation on Facebook at The Shift Network. And now your host, Dr. Shamini Jan. Hello, and welcome back to the Reuniting Science and Spirituality Summit. I'm so excited to bring to you our next guest. Her name is Dr. Helene Wabe, and Helene is the Director of Research at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, where she studies mind-body medicine and extended human capacities. Dr. Wabe has been championing the IONS Channeling Research Program, which she's going to tell us about today. And this program supports rigorous research on our ability to access information and energy that's not limited by space and time. Helene, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here with you today, Shamini. I'm excited to share about the work we're doing. I am too. You know, it's just, as I was telling you earlier, I feel that IONS is the mothership for so many explorations into noetic experiences, right? How we know ourselves and how we can utilize the gifts of being human to expand our human capacities. And I know that you all have been doing tremendous research for a long time at the Institute of Noetic, noetic Sciences um, in many different areas. But one area that you seem to be extremely passionate about um, is channeling. And I know that you've been doing some wonderful research in this area. And I was wondering, just in case some of our viewers aren't familiar with the term, and you and I have talked about this before, you know, at the Consciousness and Healing Initiative and some of our discussions, um, there are some terminology questions that come up, like, uh, what is channeling? And is it the same thing as mediumship, for example? How do we understand the similarities and differences? Thank you, Shamani. That's a great question, actually, because there is quite a bit of confusion about it. At IONS, we define channeling as being able to access information or energy beyond our traditional five senses. And those channeling experiences really exist on a spectrum from on one side, things like intuition or gut hunches, and on the other side, more extreme experiences like trans-channeling or mediumship. Now, and there are experiences in between those as well. And each one of us has the capacity to have these experiences on some level. But the way that we receive or express that information is unique to them. So when you think of the word channeling, some people might think of just the trans channeling, which is this really extreme, more rare case. When people use the word mediumship, they're often referring to people who believe they can connect with deceased humans. So humans who have passed on and either receive that information through hearing or in other ways. There's a variety of other terms like psychic or clear audience, clairvoyance. And we actually wrote a paper about all the terms that have been used for these types of exceptional human experiences and their definitions and overlap so that we could try to enlighten the field about the confusions that can happen um, and the limitations that happen when we're using these different terms. So I mentioned that we all have the capacity to receive and express information. That's what we believe at IONS and that's really what our science is focused on. How do we characterize these experiences? How common are they? Who has them? How do they affect people's lives? Um, what is the evidence that the information that we're receiving is actually true? So those are the kind of the main questions that we're seeking to answer in our IONS channeling research program. Helene, I just have to notice, I hear some some kind of like, oh, in the background. <laughs> I'm wondering if you can tell us what's going on back there. Uh, is something that's, new being channeled at this moment? Or? <laughs> yes, that's the, the chickens of the neighbor who are laying an egg. We have uh, abundance, beneficence just coming to us right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's like just magical. That's great. Here we are talking about channeling and there's literally every birthing that's going on at this moment. Love it. <laughs> 
Well, Helena, before we start diving in a little bit into the research, you know, as you know, the name of this summit is called Reuniting Science and Spirituality. And you are one of so many amazing researchers that we are talking to who are absolutely passionate about this reunification. And, you know, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your history, your story, you know, what has brought you to this work and to the work of IONS? Because, you know, I know like like me, you kind of grew up in traditional academia, right? You got your degree and you kind of know how most of us are trained. We're often trained to not even ask these kinds of questions scientifically. And here you've landed as research director at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, where you're deeply exploring the extent of these human capacities. How did you get here? Right, thank you, that's a great question. So I'm clinically trained actually as a naturopathic physician. And after I was in private practice for a while, I wanted to get back into clinical research. So I completed two postdoctoral research fellowships and received a master's in clinical research to strengthen my research training and then proceeded to do mindfulness meditation research at Oregon Health and Science University and Academic University. It was um, an incredible experience focusing on combat veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder and using uh, biomarkers like uh, brain waves, EEG, heart waves, EKG, um, cortisol, hormones, a variety of different measures to look at how meditation could really um, shift people's symptoms and um, improve their lives. Yet at this academic university, I was very limited in the types of questions that I could ask. I also taught mindfulness-based stress reduction and You know, it's a secular course on meditation. At the end of the course, people would always come up to me and say, I had this incredible transcendent experience or I'm having these spiritual experiences and I don't know what to do with that. Um, And yet at an academic university, it was very challenging to try to address these more spiritual questions that were going on. So... I was actually invited by the Institute of Noetic Sciences to come to a Future of Meditation meeting where they invited expert meditation researchers from around the world to talk about what was not being studied about meditation in the West through this huge resurgence of meditation research. So that opened my eyes to ions and their courageous work to really ask questions that no one else was asking. And it was the first time that I was able to actually look at how I could apply my academic research training to questions that I had uh, been curious about my whole life. Because from my bio, what you wouldn't know about me is that I went to my first seance when I was actually 10 years old at my grandparents' house, and that my whole mother's side of the family has um, channeling direct experiences that I was exposed to all growing up. So that was kind of a hidden in the closet part of me that I wasn't able to fully explore in an academic setting. And I'm now able to do that. And what's fascinating is that whenever I do lectures or talks around the world, invariably there is a line of people who come up to me and you know whisper in my ear you know i had this really incredible experience and i've never told anybody about it and i don't feel like i can because it's such taboo and people are going to think i'm crazy thank you so much for sharing about what you did and the work that you do um we also to really test how common is this is this common Is it this rare thing that only a few people are doing? Um, And we did a study of nine, about 900 people. It was three groups. One group was scientists and engineers. The other was people from uh, the general public in the U.S. And the other were who we call enthusiasts, which were people from the IONS listserv. And we found that the prevalence of these channeling experiences is incredibly high. About 90% across the board, people endorsed at least one channeling experience that they had had. And when we took out the ones that might be construed as, you know, kind of normal empathy or normal um, knowingness, 
um, it was still above 80%. So these exper channeling experiences are actually quite common. That was really inspiring to see and has given us um, motivation to continue this work and get the word out that people are not alone in having these experiences. I think it really is about the balance of the science and the direct experience. The science really provides a context for people to understand what they're experiencing and allows us to, um, to see how it works and how it can support us. Um, but I could also talk till I'm blue in the face about all the rigorous scientific studies that have demonstrated that yes, we can access this information and energy from beyond time and space. And yet if they haven't had that experience, it's really hard for them to get the scientific evidence. Great point. And, uh, you know, I actually want to pepper that a little bit because at the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, as you know, IONS is a partner of our collaborative. We talk to many scientists who have these experiences, whether they're channeling experiences, intuitive uh, experiences, um, healing experiences, right? And as you say, it's hard for them to often come out of the closet because of the way that our academic structures are sometimes set up. And yet, you know, I'll just tell you, we were chatting with a very well-known researcher at Harvard who is very, very excited about what we're doing and just really grateful for the community of scientists that are emerging to kind of come out of the closet and say, why is it that we can't be studying spiritual experiences scientifically? It really doesn't make any sense. And so you, I know, and, and me, you know, just even in our um, growing careers as scientists are starting to see that shift and it's exciting. And it is, you know, leading lights like the Institute of Noetic Sciences and some of our colleagues that are really helping to make this okay. Because as you say, <laughs> The, the research is suggesting that a lot of us, more the majority of us have these experiences, and yet we've been told that we're not supposed to study them. Do you have any insights on why that is and how you think that's going to shift in the coming years? Well, we're currently in a state where the materialistic paradigm is the most common, is the prevailing paradigm, which purports that our consciousness is limited to our physical body, to our physical brain, that our consciousness can't expand beyond that. So with that Western world view, many of the experiences that we have would seem to be completely impossible. So there's this dissonance between the experiences people are having and our, and our current worldview paradigm in the West. And so there's huge efforts in the scientific field now between people who are saying, actually, the materialistic paradigm is limited. There is so much more than that. And there's um, evidence demonstrating that consciousness may actually be fundamental. So I don't know, um, you know, we can study thought revolutions and how paradigms shift, but I feel like we're actually in that right now where we are moving towards a paradigm change where materialism at the very least needs to be shifted, expanded, reworked to include these new uh, findings about consciousness not being limited to the physical brain. Now, the way I think about it is, you know, it's a, a spectrum again. So there's people who are so skeptical and so ingrained in their belief that these experiences are impossible, that there's no amount of evidence that we could show them that would really shift their mind. And then there's people on the other side who've had numerous direct experiences and you know they're in the boat already we don't need to convince them and yet there's many people in the middle who may have had one or two experiences they're open they're curious and sharing with them what we're finding about our consciousness how we're able to extend beyond our bodies will really help shift things and as more and more of those people in the middle scientists included start um seeing the evidence that's growing and coupled with their own direct experience that 
at some point, I'm hoping there'll be a tipping point where that, where that taboo will shift. Um, there's been some people who also said, you know, basically the old guard just need to pass, that we just need to wait, you know, a long enough time until the old guards that really are holding on to this materialistic paradigm pass and, and things will shift. But I see it changing dramatically. It is like a grassroots um, effort. And the more that we can um, spread the word about the evidence, its commonality, that it's not a mental illness, the more we can garner resources to support rigorous re researchers like ourselves to study it and safely allow people to have those direct experiences and explore it for themselves. I think the the faster and easier this paradigm shift will occur. Yeah, really well said, right? Experience is key. Experience even drives us to explore things on the scientific level, right? It generates new hypotheses. And and there's a lot we could explore about that, you know, how is it that one remains so-called objective when we're studying this, when we're when we're exploring the mysteries of spirituality? Um, we have a filter, right? We do. We're human. So we're, you know, we're scientists. We have hypotheses. We think things are going to work out a certain way or um, we hypothesize that they might based on our experience. So it guides our um, our scientific process, right? And then yet we still have to get out of the way, right? I'm, I'm just wondering really quickly if you would mind commenting on that. You know, what is the role of a spiritual scientist when you're exploring things like channeling, which you obviously have a lot of personal experience with, right? Yes, I do. And that's a great point because, you know, there's this series of studies looking at the experimenter effect. And, you know, there's this idea in science that you need to be as unbiased as possible as the experimenter and be completely neutral about what the results are going to show you. And yet what we're finding is that, you know, the experimenter's beliefs and understanding about the experiment actually influences the results. And we're seeing this not just in parapsychology studies, but in numerous psychology studies as well. So the beliefs of the experimenter actually does matter. So what do we do about that? We work a little bit in a crisis, actually. At the very least, we need to um, acknowledge the experimenter's beliefs and whether they are, you know, attempting to be in as neutral place as possible and design the study to be as objective as possible, that their beliefs need to be part of our statistics, part of our analyses as we include them. Um, there's been uh, interesting studies done by one of our scientists, Arno Delorme, and our fellow, senior fellow, Marilyn Schlitz, looking at this experimenter effect and how the experimenter's beliefs um, can influence the results, which are quite fascinating. They're working on that manuscript now to publish it. So personally, what I attempt to do is to really be neutral, to have an open and curious mind about what the results will show, um, overlaid with Yes, I have personally experienced this phenomenon, but I don't know everything about it. I don't know how the study is actually going to turn out. So as best I can to set up rigorous study designs with controls, you know, multiple levels of controls and unbiased measures and um, try to... Um, be as neutral as possible, have our team be as neutral as possible, um, equanimity in terms of how the results are going to show up. And we often talk about this in our science meetings. We just finished a um, study with full trance channels. And if you've ever experienced uh, a trance channeler, they have quite um, remarkable shifts in their demeanor and their appearance. And so we chose them to do a physiology study of EEG, EKG, skin conductance, numerous physiological measures. And we chose them because it's uh, their, their um, 
viewing them as quite extreme. And we imagine that their physiology must change when they're in this state. So we compared channeling states to non-channeling states in 13 trans channels. And what was fascinating to us is that most of the physiological measures did not show a difference between the channeling and the no channeling states. So, you know, we, through that, tried to be as neutral as possible about what the results were going to be. And people kept asking me as we were doing this study, what are you going to find? What are you going to find? And I kept saying, I don't know. We'll find out. We'll see when it shows up. And so this is a case where even though I believed in that the channeling is a phenomenon, a real phenomenon that people experience, we didn't see a shift in the physiology from the channeling to the no channeling state. So we did see changes in voice, actually, in the frequency of the, the voice. But it just gives you a simple example of the experimenter effect, belief. Um, you know, I think at the very least, we as researchers should record that and have that be embedded in the statistics if we can. Oh, there's so much juicy stuff to dig into here. <laughs> Yeah, let's just start with, the, as you say, the experimenter effect. And so for our friends watching who aren't as familiar with all of the nuts and bolts of scientific inquiry, uh, one thing to know is that scientists who study these things as well as other areas do have kind of safeguards built in, right? Because one could say that belief can just sort of generate what's called bias, right? And so we have ways of kind of preventing that bias. So we do these randomizations where we choose people by chance to certain groups, some people who receive interventions like meditation, for example, and some who don't. And, you know, we have other ways that we control for, quote, control for effects. We often do what we call blinding, which means that if all the data is collected, we give it to someone analyzing the data that doesn't really know um, too much about the study, doesn't know what group, you know, this person is in or that person. And so there are all these kinds of safeguards that we have to kind of you know, prevent bias from happening. And that's just good science. And that's done across the board. It's done across the board at ION studies. It's done across the board at academic studies, regardless of what you're studying. So there's that. But what you're talking about, Helene, is much more profound, right? It is the understanding that our thoughts can create reality. And that is um, true, too, of the scientists. That's what we're finding in this experimenter effect. And I'd just like to share for me, you know, I, I was asked this question when we did our randomized controlled trial with healing, when we looked at the effects of hands-on healing for fatigue and breast cancer survivors. And I remember actually um, giving my results to the funding, one of the funding agencies. The study was funded by the National Institutes of Health and a nonprofit that no longer exists now, but was called Samueli Institute. And I remember when I was giving my results, they said, well, how did you control for, you know, your belief? on this, you know, how did they just, they, they knew about the experimenter effect, right? So they were like, well, how did you deal with this? And I said, you know, I literally just stepped back and said, you know, I just allow whatever is supposed to take place to take place. And I have no ownership and I have no, so what you're saying about cultivating equanimity and honestly, the practice you can say of mindfulness, right? That the cultivation of equanimity through practices like mindfulness and others are almost essential for scientists, wouldn't you say? Maybe every scientist yeah. needs to practice mindfulness or some way of cultivating equanimity so that we're That's not influencing our results as much. And the other thing that comes to me is returning back to the reunification of science and spirituality, what drives scientists, right? It's generally a sense of wonder and awe. And so if we just tap into that wonder and awe, the rest sort of takes care of itself. And, and you know, when you just told me about the results for the channeling project, you know, in terms of the physiology, my first response was not like, oh, really? It was actually, oh, wow, that's really neat. That's actually right. really neat. And I wonder what it tells us about we know that people are having specific experiences during this channeling. First of all, we know that channeling happens for many people. You just explained that in the survey results that you did, right? So people are having this experience. We have studies showing that this information is relevant and important to others. So they're actually channeling what seems to be real information um, that's valuable. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. But when we look all the way down to the physical level with the measures that had been chosen for this study, like EEG, right? And EKG, perhaps. 
we're not necessarily seeing this major physiological shift in those particular measures. Yet people do talk about these subtle shifts, right? These biofield based shifts. Right. I'm wondering right. if you can tell us more about, about that. Sure. Um, I want to just touch on this at this quantum level and that, yes, we do influence things around us in a non-local way. And so it's almost like we need to rethink the whole assumptions of the scientific method and and bias and influence of the team on the studies. So this is obviously a much bigger question that um, and crisis, if you will, that's facing the scientific community from our learnings through um, quantum physics and our understanding that we actually are more interconnected than we imagined, that we can't really separate our, ourselves from our study designs and our experiments. So I just wanted to bring that up. And then um, in terms of the physiology and the, we did look at brain waves, heart waves, skin, temperature, and all of those did not change. What we did see a shift in was uh, voice frequency. So if you've ever witnessed a trance channeler, they will, um, they believe that they are, um, their bodies being used to communicate, have a discarnate being, a purported discarnate being communicate directly through their body and their voices can be quite different. So the voice um, signature, frequency signature was different when they were channeling and not channeling. There's in our paper that this was published in Explore, we talk about some things that we believe may have um, resulted in this lack of difference. One is that the study design was such that they were oscillating between channeling and no channeling states. And then they did that six times. So it was no channeling, channeling, no channeling, channeling, no channeling, channeling. And they held each of those states for about five minutes each. So there's some people in the field who said, you know, you were asking them to switch too quickly and there was a carryover effect. Um, we looked at that with the statistics and we didn't, quite see that, but that is certainly an issue that we need to consider in the future. Um, there was another critique that we didn't do it in a naturalistic setting um, and also in a way that allowed the channelers to keep speaking. So it was actually more about um, subjective incorporation rather than channeling because the channelers were silent. And we wanted them to be silent so that we could um, have a clean EEG recording. When you're talking with EEG, it creates um, a messy signal, which makes it harder to do the analysis and not as valid. So we asked the channelers to sit there while the purported discarnate being was in their body, but not to actually speak. So that was another um concern that came up about the study and could we in the future design it in some way where they were actually talking and we could collect a clean signal. Um, because we are a noetic institute, we also had someone channel for us why um, we didn't see a result. And the channeled information that came through was that in order for the purported discarnate being to actually speak through the channeler, they need to match their energy or frequency with the channeler's energy and frequency. And so we may not necessarily see a difference because they needed to align in order to actually do the channeling process. We are... The EEG that we looked at was a simple frequency analysis. We're also looking at um, more advanced techniques that looks at the connection between the different parts of the brain, um, which was advised to us from this channeled information. And so, you know, those are just a few ideas. And then you mentioned, of course, the biofield. We don't really have um, an excellent, valid way 
to measure the, the biofield right now. There are a number of techniques out there that have um, some limited use and that yet the validation of them is uh, still needing to happen. So I would very much like to include biofield measures in the future. You know, everyone talks about a shift in energy or frequency or light, and yet we don't really have a way to measure that in a valid, coherent way. And at IONS, in collaboration with Qi, we're hoping to really move that field forward because I feel like it is an obstacle to um, our learning and our uh, rigorous methods to not have a uh, reliable, valid device to actually see the biofield and how it's shifting and changing. So people can experience it. Sensitives can walk into a room and feel that something's different or, you know, notice changes in a person if they're um, going through a hard time. And I think that's beyond simple empathy. Um, and so how do we actually measure that? Perhaps we can learn from our own physiology um, to develop a kind of multi-signal measure that would allow us to observe these changes more objectively and even perhaps show it to others. What if we could, you know, show people a picture? I know there's Karelian photography and various visualization techniques, and yet, um, you know, I would love to see more validation of those to be able to use them confidently. Agree. I think a number of us feel that way, right? And there are some promising technologies that are out there that have been studied more in Europe than in the U.S. And um, certainly it seems like some of the most sensitive detectors we have are humans. And you've given us a lot of food for thought, right, on how do we conduct these studies and how do we keep from constraining the actual phenomena in the laboratory, right? And we've seen this all across the board. Let's uh, throw an adept meditator in a scanner and look at his brain waves because that's what we think is important, you know, or let's have him meditate, then stop, meditate, then stop. You know, the same thing with channelers. It's not really how it's done, you know, and we right. see this in intervention research too, when we take acupuncture and we try to put it into the lab or even hands-on healing. And we're not really perhaps honoring um, the way that it's often done. And, and, you know, it means that we have to ask different types of questions, right? We're getting, um, we're moving perhaps less away from a prove-it model to let's explore what this is model, right? And so maybe that's the first way to begin. It's, it's really important and valuable. So for those who may be new to channeling, you had said that, you know, over 80% of people experience this, even if we take out kind of things like general intuition or whatever. I'd love to dial in a little bit more on, you know, what is the relevance of channeling as an extended human capacity? I mean, what does it, what does it do for humanity? And um, how is it, is it a skill that we can cultivate? Right. Um, through our surveys, we have found that the impact of these channeling experiences on people's lives is overwhelmingly positive. So it's very rare to have anybody say that the information that they're receiving or the energy that they're receiving from beyond space and time has harmed them in some way or um, negatively affected them in any way. In fact, they say that it has positively impacted their life. So on a basic level, there is meaning that people receive from these experiences. Um, also, you know, we're in such a difficult place in our planet right now. There's so many intractable problems that we can't see solutions for. And I guess my response to you is why not? If we could actually receive information that could support us as individuals and collectively on our planet to help um, improve, shift, you know, bring our beautiful global community to a greater place of compassion and love and kindness to ourselves, to other, to our environment. Um, and finding, you know, novel solutions to some of our um, severe issues that are threatening all of us. Why wouldn't we explore that? Why wouldn't we at the very least be curious 
to see if we could find valuable information um, to support us in that. Through, I've done a number of studies looking at the content that's coming through. And through various channelers, through various um, um, areas, there's some common themes. One is around how channeling works and the different mechanisms of channeling. Um, but overwhelmingly, the most content is about supporting humanity to wake up, to evolve, to um, acknowledge their true nature, which is described as being more than our bodies and not being limited to our bodies and uh, transcending that. And that we are all interconnected and the most fundamental aspect of that is love that at our true core, we are all love. And various techniques um, brought through to um, communicate how to actually help humanity wake up. For example, one is around balancing the masculine and feminine, um, supporting each human to balance the masculine and feminine within themselves. Um, there's also some content around um, you know, other worlds, um, other dimensions, and, you know, various aspects beyond our um, earthly world. And obviously, you know, people say, well, do you believe this stuff? Is this stuff real? There's really no way at this point with the tools that we have to verify it. However, I find it quite fascinating that various channelers from around the world who are channeling independently are bringing forth similar content. And you might say, oh, you know, they read the other channelers information and that's what's coming through. These are such isolated um, events that I have a hard time. Uh, seeing that. And so one of my dream projects is to do a very large systematic um, collection of channeled information to really look at, um, do the themes that we've seen in our various studies actually replicate around the world and to do this in a systematic way and see what are the similarities, what are the differences in those themes. I think that would be quite powerful. And then um, finally, I want to just talk about using this in our daily lives. You know, it's the noetic means um, inner wisdom or inner knowing and being able to essentially go within and um, ask yourself what you need to know in that moment. We're all faced with so many decisions in our days about how to behave uh, life choices, and what if we felt more resourced to be able to um, answer those questions more easily, more confidently from, you know, gathering information and resources from beyond our five senses. So I would say, why not? Um, like I mentioned, we at IONS believe that we all have the capacity to receive information and energy from beyond time and space, and that the way that each of us do that's quite unique. And so part of our organization, our experience department, um, builds curriculum to support people to explore this. What is your unique noetic signature? What does that look like? Um, can we assess it? How do we nurture it to support you in your daily life? to um, live the best life that you can live. Yeah, so important, right? Many of us may have the experience, the feeling, the belief that uh, spirit is here to help us get through this time. And so as you say, Helene, why not, right? Why not mm -hmm. allow ourselves to open up to that wisdom and that felt experience of love, which as they say is really the true essence of our being, right? And the more that we can tap into that felt experience of love, the easier it's going to be to get ourselves out of the messes that we've made, you know? It's really the truth. So 
I want to thank you so much for all the tireless work that you have done at the Institute of Noetic Sciences and through your work even before that and all the work that you will continue to do for many years in this field. You are a leading light in the areas of noetic experience and noetic exploration. And I thank you so much for all of the amazing work that you do. Now, if people want to learn more about you and more about the work at, that you do and that at the Institute of Noetic Sciences does, where can we reach you? Thank you so much, Shomini. You can reach us at www.noetic.org. There you will find um, our mission, our strategic focus for the next five years that includes science and direct experience. We also have some wonderful search engines so you can see all of our peer reviewed publications on these topics and another search engine that allows you to look at our various studies that we have done. Each one of these points that I've been making today corresponds to a paper that is published and in the um, general domain that you can learn more about. So I invite you to visit our website and come explore uh, this nature of reality and interconnectedness with us. Super, and thank you everyone who has been exploring with us today and exploring with Helene the wonderful work of Noetic Wisdom. Thank you so much and see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for the Reuniting Science and Spirituality Summit, brought to you by the Shift Network. You can add every teaching and transcript to your personal library by visiting reunitingscienceandspirituality.com slash upgrade. To learn more about awakening to your full potential, and together co-creating a world that works for all, visit theshiftnetwork.com.